Our dear Father in heaven, thank you for this day that uh, you have made that we may rejoice in thee and we may be able to share in the truth that was once delivered to the saints. And so give us uh, a good mind to listen and to be able to hear the voice of the Spirit speak to us through thy Son. In his name we pray. Amen. Welcome again in this uh, session. This is number four in uh, Minneapolis 1888. And uh, I'm going to look at uh, uh, a presentation by um, the name, uh, the basis of our salvation, the basis of our salvation. And so my sincere plea is that uh, we may be able to understand things, not the way that I'll present them, but the way that the Lord will want us to understand them. Um, we left off at some point in the previous uh, presentation where actually we saw the statement of Uriah Smith that uh, man can only be saved by keeping the law of God. And uh, I'll start from somewhere uh, from where we left uh, in the previous presentation. A uh, question that uh, we left to be addressed in this presentation we are in is my acceptance in the final judgment will be based on what? A, my character. This is the options that we are looking in. B, the character which Christ has worked out within me. C, forgiveness of sin. And uh, on the surface level, everyone will say this uh, 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 um uh, this is the basis of our acceptance in the final judgment. On, on the surface level, this is what will be said. It is the truth. But then, uh, as we continue studying into the message of Minneapolis 1888, you will find out things being refined in minute way, the way the Lord wanted them to be refined. And you may find nuances, you may find them different with what uh, we may conclude that these three are the basis of our salvation. And so uh, revisiting what uh, uh, Smith had to say, the law is spiritual, holy, just, good, and good, the divine standard of righteousness, perfect obedience to it will develop perfect righteousness, and that is only way anyone can attain to righteousness. That the only way one can attain to righteousness is obedient to the law of God. Now, how do you reconcile this statement with where actually we are told pagans will be in heaven, imbeciles will be in heaven, and uh, heathens will be in heaven. How do you reconcile with this statement perfect obedience to the law of God will uh, develop perfect righteousness? And this is the only way anyone can attain righteousness. How do you reconcile with imbeciles, heathens, and pagans will be in heaven? And then he goes ahead and says, There is not a seventh day Adventist in the land who has not been taught better than to suppose that in his own strength. He could keep the commandments or do anything without Christ. So he tries to justify the previous statement with the following statement that uh, Seventh-day Adventists have been told that they have to rely on Jesus Christ to be able to do the above things. But then, uh, continued on, let us look at this. Before Minneapolis 1888, sanctification was seen as the basis of salvation. That is... Uh, and when we speak about uh, uh, sanctification, it is um, the, um, the imparted righteousness, not the imputed righteousness, not what Christ has done, but what Christ is doing through us, what we are doing. It was considered as the basis of salvation. And that is why I have uh, um, named this the basis of our salvation. We want to see what is the basis of salvation. Prior to 1888, this is how it was used. Sanctification was seen as the basis of salvation. Now, again, somebody may ask you that uh, the thief on the cross, how did he outplay this issue of sanctification or uh, imparted righteousness, not imputed one? Because he never came down to perform the things in the law. He just believed and would be saved. 
And so when certain statements are made, some certain qualifications have to be made also. The work of Christ in justification was seen primarily in regard to our sins of the past. And uh, we want to enter into this. We handle a little bit in the third presentation. But in this fourth presentation, we want to enter into the minute things about uh, if justification is just about the past sin or also covers the future sin. That it means that it gives you victory over what may come according to first john 2 1 that uh, i write unto you that you may not sin but if you sin you have an advocate has he catered justification has it catered for the past sin alone or has it catered also for the future sin does justification on is is it only a legal term you see when we say that uh, justification covers the past sin it's only a legal term but when we say that justification also covers the future sins it means that it comes with the power to be able to resist that which is in the future that is how it covers for the sins in the future it doesn't mean that you will sin and then you are covered no it means that you are given power over anything that may be in the future and if you happen to stumble according to first john 2 1 then justification on the cross christ doesn't have to die again as the lamb of god no Christ has covered you on Calvary and then his mediation that is in the dual atonement, if you stumble, covers you in that uh, same way. And so we don't need a lamb again, but we just need uh, uh, an advocate to represent us before the Father. And so if we can see sanctification as the basis of salvation and justification, just uh, covering for the sins past, then... Um, uh, uh, we, we, we are missing something in between there and uh, without going into much uh, ahead, I just I'd like us to go uh, step by step. In science of the time, uh, this is what the anonymous had to write and say, and uh, uh, talking about that uh, justification doesn't only cover the sin in the past, in, in, but the sins in the future. This is what uh, we read in the science of the time. As uh, all have violated God's law and cannot of themselves render obedient to his just requirements, we are dependent on Christ first for justification from our past offenses and secondly for grace whereby to render accept and obedience to his holy law in the time to come. Anonymous fundamental principle signs of the time, June 4, 1874. So justification was seen not only covering the past sin, but also covering the future obedience to the law of God. And so, uh, unlike, uh, I think the article of justification by faith had been lost sight of. That is why God brought in um, uh, E.J. Wagner and uh, Alonzo Trevor Jones so that uh, they may be able to clear out the air and um, come out of this um, legalistic view on justification. You know, what Adventism was uh, having at the time before Minneapolis 1888, it can be termed as a, a legalistic way of looking at justification, where actually somebody just say, dies for you, and then uh, uh, that is all. It doesn't come with the power. It, it acts like the judge in the court. When you have a good lawyer, if you have stolen, the lawyer will contend for your case, and the judge says that you are innocent. Go home. But that announcement does not give you the power to stop being a thief. And so this is how actually Adventism was built, that um, uh, justification was only for the person, for the judge to announce that, uh, okay, you have been forgiven, but where is the power for living in the future life? This is something that had been lost, and uh, it was a legal religion. And Sister White says that we had preached the law until we are as dry as the hills of Gilboa. We need to preach Christ in the law. And why preach Christ in the law? This is why what we want to find out in the whole scenario. And so in uh, Christ Our Righteousness, page 6, paragraph 1, this is by A.G. Daniel talking about uh, justification, what actually it is. The word of God clearly portrays the way of righteousness by faith. The writings of the spirit of prophecy greatly amplify and elucidate the subject. In our blindness and dullness of heart, we have wandered far out of the way and for many years have been failing to appropriate this sublime truth. So this is A.G. Daniel confessing that uh, we had failed. 
But all the while, our great leader has been calling his people to come into line on this great fundamental of the gospel, receiving by faith the imputed righteousness of Christ for sins that are past and the imparted righteousness of Christ for revealing the divine nature in human flesh. So, this is what we're going to have to cover. Man's obedience can never satisfy God's law. Contrary to what actually uh it seems a battle between Wagner and Uriah and how they view things. Um, number two, Christ imputed righteousness alone is the basis of our acceptance by God, not the imparted righteousness. We will see that in a little while in E.G. White writings also, that uh, the imputed righteousness is enough for our acceptance before God. Say, today I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior and I die immediately. Where is imparted righteousness there is none but the imputed righteousness this does not negate the fact that if you are allowed to live the outworking of the imputed righteousness should be seen in our lives and god uh, allowing we can look at um, romans just uh romans chapter 5 which actually speaks about um, justification experience that when we receive pardon we have to experience that but uh, 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 pardon and what I'm saying is this. Suppose I was having a debt of uh, $100, $1, whichever figure that you'd want to say. And then the debtor comes and tells me, you know what, Sam? I forgive you. I cancel your debt. Now, is my acceptance with this person based on my repaying the debt or uh, him forgiving the debt? And even after the date is uh, 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 cancelled, do I have to outperform something for to appease this person who really forgave me of the debt? No. And then this is the issue that uh, do I have to leave out as somebody who is in debt or who is debt free? I have to leave as a person who is out of debt. I don't have to see this person and run away. I don't have to walk like a, a person who is under a burden of something while it has been lifted from me. And so I have been accepted because of what he has done. But then I have to live out a life that shows that I have been forgiven. But my acceptance is not based on what I'm doing now, living after uh, living a life of uh, 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 trying to please the person, but uh, I'm just living out the life of being accepted without the debt. And so it is a fruit of being forgiven. And uh, 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 as I say that uh, uh, if we don't live like uh, we have been forgiven, then we are still in the debt and justification has no meaning at all. And so uh, here we're going to continue to say that uh, we constantly need the covering of Christ's righteousness, not just for the sins past. The justification covers the whole thing. The lamp of Christ that taketh away the sin of the world, past and in the future. And so my point here, actually, if it seems confusing, it is that if I'm pardoned today and I die today, only Christ's righteousness covers me. And so it is with everyone. It's only Christ's righteousness which covers us and he imparts everything. And we enjoy the, uh, the, the, the justification that we have found through the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And so here, some of the points that we looked at that I want just to bring about before we enter into fully the basis of our salvation. Let the reader try to picture the sin. Here stands the law as the sweet witness against the sinner. It cannot change. It will not call a sinner a righteous man. The convicted sinner tries again and again to obtain righteousness from the law, but it resists all his advances. It cannot be bribed by any amount of penance or professedly good deeds, but there stands Christ full of grace as well as truth. And what is he doing? Calling the sinner to him. At last, the sinner, weary of uh, the vain struggle to get righteousness from the law, listens to the voice of Christ and flees to his outstretched arms. Hiding in Christ, he is covered with his righteousness, and now behold, he has obtained through faith in Christ that for which he has been vainly striving. 
He has the righteousness which the law requires. And it is the genuine article because he obtained it from the source of righteousness from the very place when the law came. In Psalms 32 verses 1 and 2, 5 to 8 and 11, David, understanding what it means to have the imputed righteousness of Christ, says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputed not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guide. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and my iniquity have I not hid. I say, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. Thou art my hiding place, thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I'll guide thee with mine eye. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. This is uh, the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. He is not imputing iniquity, but he is imputing his righteousness. But without faith, it is impossible to please God, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. In Luke chapter 17, verse 10, so likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants, we have done that which was our duty to do. And so there is no room for anyone boasting that um, this and this has gained me the eternal life. If Christ could have not intervened, then we are nothing. And so we have to see that in Christ, there is the fulfillment of the law. That when we have him in our hearts, the spirit will outwork the principle of righteousness and not by our own. In whom you also trusted Ephesians 1, 13 to 14. After that, he had the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that he believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So in receiving the spirit of Christ, we receive the spirit of righteousness, which actually brings in the fruit of the spirit. And um, we are told in Galatians 5.22, um, uh, if we have all these days, nothing against the law, if we have the fruit of the spirit. And whose spirit is that? Galatians 4.6, the spirit of Christ in us, Hebrews 9, 14, the eternal spirit. Now, that eternal spirit is the same spirit that Christ used to overcome sin. And it is the one that urges our conscience so that uh, we may not continue in dead works. In Galatians 4, 6, as we have seen, and because he has sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And so, creature merit melts at this point because it is not us but it is the spirit of the son working in us to do uh to will and to do of his own good pleasure romans 8 9 but ye are not in the flesh but in the spirit if so be that the spirit of god dwell in you now if any man have not the spirit of christ he is none of his and remember that uh, as i said it is the spirit of christ which wills to to uh, uh, does the willing and the performing of his own pleasure, knowing that ye are the temple, knowing not that ye are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you. And why continue to insist that it is the spirit of Christ dwelleth, which dwelleth in us so that we may know that when the spirit of Christ is in us, we reproduce of the same kind. You know, in Genesis chapter one in creation, every seed had two reproduce of, of its own kind. And so when Christ is in us, we shall reproduce of the same kind. No wonder we are told that um, um, whoever is born of God does not commit sin, that is, he does not willfully sin, he does not continue in rejoicing in sin, because the spirit of he who has born him, the seed of he who has born him, uh, uh, 
uh, dwelleth in him and he cannot sin. He cannot willfully continue in sin. He cannot continue entertaining the things that are used to love and uh, 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 continue uh, uh, really saying that he's a Christian. The seed of the woman creates an enmity with the seed of the serpent. And so in Galatians 3.16, that seed is not as to many, which means many seeds, but unto the seed which is Jesus Christ. So the seed of Christ, if it dwells in us, that seed that has undying element, that seed that has a germinating principle, we, when it is in us, we reproduce the works of Christ or the works of God. And so people have to see Christ in the law, that uh, all that the law embodies, it is the spirit of Christ. And when we are in the possession of that spirit, that is, uh, the law is about um, uh, uh, loving God with all your heart and loving your neighbor uh, as you love yourself. This is the embodiment of the law itself. But you cannot do that unless you possess the spirit of Christ. When you have the possession of it, loving God and loving your neighbor, it's not something to start struggling about. The law of God is not so uh, difficult that we, it, it's not so burdensome, we are told, but it is simple. And so instead of uh, fighting with the law, why don't we fight with the genuine article, having the spirit of Christ in us and then being able to do the things that the law requires us to do? Uh, in uh, Letters and Manuscript, Volume uh, 3, Letters and Manuscript, Volume 3, Letter 46, 1879, paragraph 6. Something important that we read here also. Or the Christian last, or the Christian's last day may be fragrant because the beams of the sun of righteousness shine through the life, diffusing a perpetual fragrance. Oh, what reason have we for joy that our Redeemer poured out his precious blood on the cross as an atonement for sin, and by his obedience to death brought in everlasting righteousness? You know that today he is at the Father's right hand, a Prince of life, a Savior. There is no other name wherein you can trust your eternal interest, but in Christ you may rely fully implicitly. Christ has been loved by you, although your faith has sometimes been feeble and your prospects confused. But Jesus is your Savior. He does not save you because you are perfect, but because you need him and in your imperfection have trusted in him. This is a very rather amazing uh, statement that E.G. White says that he does not save you because you are perfect, but because you need him and in your imperfection have trusted in him. And so this continual reliance on Christ and looking at him, it's what we are saved by. And this is the wooing of the spirit day in, day out. As we behold him, we continue to change. This does not mean that uh, we cherish sin and remain imperfect because the God says you, he does not save you because you are perfect. Uh, there are people who will read this and say that, why am I even uh, uh, worrying about perfection? It is something that we should actually check on it. If we are not walking in the will of God, then we should be worried. And so we should not rest with cheap grace. I don't need to be perfect. God himself says in Matthew 5, 48, be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. But how do we come to this perfection? In our confused prospects, we can behold Jesus Christ and he can save us in our imperfection in this way that we are continually looking unto him. And as we continue looking unto him, if he comes and his will is our will to continue in the ways of that the Father will like us to do, and doing everything His Spirit is guiding us to do, then He will save us. Not because we have perfected ourselves, but He has given us His Spirit to cry, Abba, Father, daily. The Spirit has given us is to cry, Abba, Father, daily, to continue relying on Him. And even though there may be things that uh, we may not understand, but he understands better, he will still save us because we are relying on him step by uh, step. 
in John 6, 63, it is the spirit that quickeneth the flesh profiteth nothing. The word that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And as we assimilate this, as we eat the flesh of Jesus Christ and drink of his blood, we are assimilated in the same image. We are turned from glory to glory. And uh, Peter says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by this ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through us. Now, in Titus 2.11, we are told that um, for the grace of the Lord has appeared to everyone, teaching us to deny ungodliness and live soberly in the present world. That is escaping the corruption that is in this world through us. As we do that, we partake of the divine nature. We partake of the image of the Son of God. To whom God will make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And righteousness, actually, we are told it is Christ formed within. Christ formed within. Uh, and uh, I, I can just uh, bring this uh, on. Uh, when we talk about Christ being formed within, uh, Christ being formed within, in uh, one of the letters to the poor and downtrodden, uh, that is manuscript 24, 1898, Manuscripts 24, 1898. Here is what she says. We shall learn the value of human soul when we learn to value the love of God for us. A divine Savior died for all that all might find in him their divine source. In Christ Jesus, we are one lifted up, lifted to the same rank, members of the royal family, children of the heavenly king, by the utterance of one name, our Father through Jesus Christ who loved us and gave his life ransom for us. This places an equal value upon all. To the poor and oppressed and downtrodden of earth, Christ says, if you love me, keep my commandments and I'll pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter, even the spirit of truth, which is Christ formed within the hope of glory, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, but you know him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I'll not leave you comfortless. Speaking about the spirit that we give us, it is Christ formed within the hope of glory. When we have the spirit of Christ, when we have this spirit that Christ our Father, then we have Christ formed within the hope of glory. We have the another comforter, John chapter 14. This is what Christ is seeking to give us. The promise of the Father, the another comforter, the spirit of truth, so that he may be formed within the hope of glory. This is the mystery of godliness amongst the Gentiles that has to be seen in this last day. Christ's righteousness shining upon his children. And how do they come to possess this righteousness? By receiving the spirit of Christ, which will form Christ within the hope of glory. In uh, Review and Herald, December 15, 1891, paragraph 9, the converted soul lives in Christ. His darkness passes away and a new and heavenly light shines into his soul. He that winneth souls is wise. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. What is done through the cooperation of men with God is a work that shall never perish, but endure through the eternal ages. He that makes God his wisdom that grows up into the full stature of a man in Christ Jesus will stand before kings, before the so-called great men of the world, and show forth the praises of him who hath called him out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Science and literature cannot bring into the darkened mind of men the light which the glorious gospel of the Son of God can bring. And so if we want to shine as the law of God shines. What we need is the glorious gospel. And the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Therein is found righteousness. To the Jew and to the Gentiles, the just shall live by faith. And so, um, this literature cannot bring into the darkened mind 
of men that light with the glorious gospel of the Son of God can bring. The Son of God alone can do the great work of illuminating the soul. No wonder Paul exclaims, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. The gospel of Christ becomes a personality, becomes personality in those who believe and makes them living episodes known and read of all men. In this way, the living of goldness passes into the multitude. The heavenly intelligences are able to design the true elements of greatness in character, for only goodness is deemed as efficiency with God. And so the gospel of Christ becomes a personality. If you receive the gospel, if you receive the spirit of Christ, if you receive the word of God, the personality of Christ is formed within you. The spirit works on the mind and then uh, uh, that gospel you receive becomes a person. A person is someone who is living actively uh, uh, in a way or another. And so we become the embodiment of the gospel. We become the reality of the gospel. We become the person of the gospel. Even though the gospel is written uh, in the Bible or it is spoken or it is imparted by either uh, uh, um, a small voice or by audible voice, when we accept it, we become it is personality. We can be walking, walking episodes, as uh, Paul says in the book of Corinthians. Not by painful struggle or wearisome toil, not by gift or sacrifice is righteousness obtained, but it is freely given to every soul who hungers and thirsts to receive it. For everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and uh, he that hath no money, come ye by and eat. Without money and without price, their righteousness is of me, said the Lord, and this is the name where in, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Isaiah 55, 1, 54, 17, Jeremiah 23, 6. Uh, all in the package in Mount of Blessing, page 18, paragraph 2. And look at this statement, their righteousness is of me. It is not their righteousness. It is my righteousness in them. And they shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Everyone who will enter into heaven, it will be the Lord our righteousness. Not what we have done, not we have, what we have performed, but what Christ has done uh, for us and uh, uh, in us and through us. No man will enter the portals of heaven because of uh, what he can claim that he has done. If entering in heaven is based on what we outperform, then uh, uh, it can be, heaven can be wages of working for righteousness. Jesus willing in our hearts will make the difference. Uh, let us in manuscript volume nine, uh, Man, 40, 18, 94, paragraph 12. But that which God required of Adam in paradise before the fall, he requires in this age of the world from those who will follow him. Perfect obedience to his law. But righteousness without a blemish can only be obtained through the imputed righteousness of Christ. Think about that for a moment. That righteousness without a blemish can be obtained through the imputed righteousness of Christ, not the imparted righteousness. The imparted righteousness is what actually just Christ allows us to do. And sometimes we even do good things, which are biblical, but even our motives, bottom line, our hearts are so defiled that at the end of the day, it is only the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ that uh, will do everything. And so think about that. The Lord is ready to do like things for all those who believe. Jesus longs to quicken our hearts with healthful spiritual life. Jesus dwelling in the soul, purifying and ennobling all faculties, guiding us into all truth makes us a bright and shining light unto the world. Then let not this light burn dim. Moment by moment we need to live looking unto Jesus who is the author and finisher of our faith. Now what was the problem in uh, the years leading to 1888, we are told that um, men had been trained or men had been taught to look unto man. They needed to be pointed to Jesus Christ. And that is what we are coming on in a few slides. And so the picture of Jesus Christ had to be lifted up. Righteousness of Christ, this is letter 
letters and manuscript, volume 6, letter 1, E, 1890, paragraph 5. Righteousness of Christ imputed to men means holiness, uprightness, purity, unless Christ's righteousness was imputed to us, we could not have acceptable repentance. The righteousness dwelling in us by faith consists of love, forbearance, meekness, and all the Christian virtues. Here, the righteousness of Christ is laid hold of and becomes a part of our being. All who have this righteousness will work the works of God, will experience sanctification, will have the imparted righteousness now being seen. You know, I can say that uh, imputed righteousness is that inner person that is not seen. Imparted righteousness is that outside person seen. And so imparted righteousness is um, uh, 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 the outworking of the inner righteousness which is imputed. That which is hidden inside when it actually illuminates the heart, it shines abroad out. Just like uh, the Shekinah glory came into the temple inside the most holy place, but that light emanating from that Shekinah glory could go outside and people could be able to see it. So when Christ imputes in us his righteousness, that is um, uh, holiness, uprightness, and purity, and then uh, love, forbearance, meekness, and all Christian values, when he puts them in heart via imputed righteousness, when actually it is accepted by faith, it doesn't uh, remain in heart. Uh, the heart doesn't remain in darkness, but now it is the light that has been put there. And where there is light, darkness is not there. It diffuses everywhere that it is. And then it uh, uh, comes out that it can be seen by all men. In fact, we are told that uh, in him was life, and that life is the light that lighteth every man that cometh into this world, and that life is his righteousness. In Psalms 116, verse 12, What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefit toward me? I'll take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I'll repay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. O Lord, truly I am thy servant. I am thy servant and the son of thine handmaid. Thou hast loosed my bones. I'll offer to thee the sacrifice of what? Thanksgiving. And all we can do is to thank the Lord that uh, he has procured unto us what money cannot buy. And I'll call upon the name of the Lord. 18, I'll pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of thee, O Jerusalem, praise thee, the Lord, for all the benefits that he has accorded us. Isaiah 61 verse 10, I'll greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with the ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. For as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causeth the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. Now, if you have done gardening, you understand the lessons of uh, farming. You have a seed, and that seed, you put it in the ground, an environment that has been prepared so well. And in that seed, according to COL38, there is a germinating principle in it which doesn't die. So when the environment is good, it springs forth and brings much fruit. That is what John chapter 15 is all about, that uh, Christ also, uh the fruit. Those who remain in the vine, they bear much fruit. And uh, if we remain in him, we shall bear much fruit. I ask, how can I, how can I present this matter as it is? The Lord Jesus imparts all the powers and all the grace, all the penitence, all the inclination, all the pardon of sins in uh, presenting his righteousness for man to grasp by living faith, which is also the gift of God. If you gather together everything that is good and holy and noble and loving in man, and then present the subject to the angels of God as acting apart in the salvation of the human soul or in merit, the proposition will be rejected as prison. Standing in the presence of their creator and looking upon the unsurpassed glory which enshrouds his person, they are looking upon the lamp of God given 
from the foundation of the world to a life of humiliation, to be rejected of sinful men, to be despised, to be crucified. Who can measure the infinity of the sacrifice? And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners and just adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithe of all that I possess, and the publican standing afar off will not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. This is uh, Christ in his righteousness, page um, 57, paragraph 2 by E.J. Wagon. It is not for our goodness that he loves us, but because of our need. You, you remember the quote by E.G. White that uh, although you have confused prospects, he doesn't accept you because you are perfect, but he accepts you because you continually look unto him and rely in, on him in humility. So E.J. Wagoner has this also to say, it's not for our goodness that he loves us, but because of our need. He receives us not for the sake of anything that he sees in us, but for his own sake and for what he knows that his divine power can make of us. It is only when we realize the wonderful exaltation and holiness of God and the fact that he comes to us in our sinful and degraded condition to adopt us into his family that we can appreciate the force of the apostle's exclamation. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. 1 John 3, 1. Everyone upon whom this honor has been bestowed will purify himself even as he is pure. God continued on in page 69, Christ and his righteousness. God does not adopt us as his children because we are good, but in order that he may make us good. Says Paul, God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loves us, even when we were dead in sins, had quickened us, made us alive, together with Christ, by grace he has saved and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus, Ephesians 2, 4 to 7. And then he adds, for the grace, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before then that we should walk in them, verses 8 and 10. This passage shows that God loved us while we were yet dead in sins. He gives us his spirit to make us alive in Christ, and the same spirit marks our adoption into the divine family. And he thus adopts us that, as new creatures in Christ, we may do the good works which God has ordained. So we don't do good works and then we are adopted, but we are adopted then enabled to do those good works. In Christ, our righteousness by A.G. Daniels, page 67, when the sinner believes that Christ is his personal savior, then according to his unfailing promises, God pardons his sin and justifies him freely. The repentant soul realizes that his justification comes because Christ as his substitute and surety has died for him as his atonement and righteousness. To be in Herald, November 4, 1890. In series A, number 9, page 62, A. Daniel in Christ our righteousness, page 104, paragraph 2, he says, What is justification by faith? It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man that which it is not in his power to do for himself. When men see their own nothingness, they are prepared to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Praise the Lord. It is when we shall see we are nothing, that is when we shall be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. In page uh, 6, uh, uh, we, we saw this in Glad Tidings, page 81, paragraph 2. Let no professed Christian take counsel of his own imperfections and say that it is impossible for a Christian to live a sinless life. 
it is impossible for a true Christian, one who has full faith, to live any other kind of life. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Romans 6, 2. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed do anything him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. 1 John 3, 9. So if we have received Christ in our lives, we cannot live another life, but a life of victory. Victory lies in receiving Christ. Glad tidings 132 paragraph 1. It is so rare for men to do anything without expecting an equivalent that theologians have taken it for granted that it is the same with God. So they begin their dissertations on God's covenant with the statement that a covenant is a mutual agreement between two or more persons to do or refrain from doing certain things. But God does not make bargains with men because he knows that they could not fulfill their part. After the flood, God made a covenant with every beast of the earth and with every fall, but the beast and the birds did not promise anything in return. Genesis 9, 9 to 16. They simply received the favor at the hand of God. That is all we can do. God promises us everything that we need and more than we can ask for things as a gift. We give him ourselves that is nothing and he gives us himself that is everything. That which makes us all that which makes all the trouble is that even when men are willing to recognize the Lord at all, they want to make bargains with, with him. They want it to be a mutual affair, a transaction in which they will be considered as on a par with God. But whoever deals with God must deal with him on his own terms. That is on a basis of fact that we have nothing and are nothing, and he has everything and is everything and gives everything. April 22, 1901, General Conference Bulletin, page 404, paragraph 6. We need to settle every one of us whether we are out of the Church of Rome or not. Now, this is a very important uh, statement because what is Rome based on? Righteousness by works. In fact, the mark of the beast versus the seal of God is righteousness by work versus righteousness by faith. Men seeing that the times are so difficult, they will look unto men for survival, but they just shall live by faith. So the, the real issue in the Sunday law in the end times is between righteousness by works versus righteousness by faith. Can you do this so that you may be forgiven? Can you uh, uh, even now uh, bring penance, pay for sins and then be forgiven. This is the Roman Catholicism. And so we need to settle every one of us whether we are out of the church of Rome or not. There are a great many that have got the marks yet, but I am persuaded of this, that every soul who is here tonight desires to know the way of truth and what? Righteousness. We cannot have righteousness and also think that we can want for our salvation. Either one collapses with the other. Congregation, amen. And that is there, there is no one here who is unconsciously clinging to the dogmas of the purpose who does not desire to be freed from them. And this is what we need to be freed from. You know, the people come to the priest, they confess their sins, and they tell the priest also, you know, tomorrow I might sin, so I need to pay penance or I need you to forgive me or do this. This is not how God wants, like the earthly priest. In, in the Roman system, Roman Catholicism system, we need to come out of Roman Catholicism. And so in NS 48, 1891, paragraph 52, we are told it's not your spirit that is going into heaven. It is Christ's spirit. That is a sublime one. That uh, no man's spirit, what he has done and all this and all this stuff, and how he has shown to be good that is going to heaven. It is Christ's spirit that is an a, a, a emptying of self as Christ did and relying on the Father, that is the hand of, of omnipotence, to be in this world and to conquer everything. That is the spirit that is going to heaven, not our own spirit. Will you have it? Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into him and will serve with him and he with me. Revelation 3.20. Then I ask, how is it that so many of you are saying you do not know whether you are accepted of God or not? 
that you want to find Jesus? Don't you know whether you have opened the door? Don't you know whether you have invited him in? If you have not, invite him now. Don't wait a moment. Open the door and let Jesus in. Not let another God come in. You know, we are looking at um, the 1888 messages, and it's coming clear that, uh, as Sister White says, that we have a message with divine credentials. The divine picture of Jesus Christ should be placed before the people every now and then. And uh, we are told that a message setting forth the fullness of the Godhead in Jesus Christ has been presented to us by Wagona and John Jones. This is what we are talking about. Let Christ in. He is the one who is coming in, not another person. We are saying, receive his spirit and you will have the righteousness of the law, the righteousness of the Father, according to uh, Philippians. Son. Look at uh, Philippians chapter um, Philippians chapter 3. Uh, Philippians. Chapter 3, verses 9. And be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God. So whatever we have to be found with is the righteousness which is of God, gotten through the faith, um, uh, through Jesus Christ. Christ is the mediator. And he is uh, the, the man in the middle. So here we are told that uh, it is not your spirit that is going into heaven. It is Christ's spirit. And this spirit actually it brings the righteousness of the Father, which is only acceptable to, uh, 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 to, to be, which is only acceptable that can match the broken law. And so invite him in. Don't invite another strange God in you. We have been presented with Jesus Christ, who he is and who is to be received. We don't have to receive another person to be accepted of God. Another person who doesn't have the experience of relying on the hand of, of omnipotence to overcome the sins in the world. It is only Jesus Christ who came here, relied on the Father and overcame sin. And now he can give us his spirit and so that we may also obtain the righteousness of the Father as he obtained the righteousness of the Father too. So where is the law there in us? We bring this to a close. Where is the law? After all saying this, and this message is being presented to the people who are there, somebody may end up, you have just done away with the law completely. And uh, that is why what Sister White was saying that uh, somebody will come to you and say, you are so honest with this issue of righteousness by faith. In fact, um, uh, I'll have to, uh, to go to this slide that um, uh, talks uh, about uh, the, somebody telling you that uh, you are so honest. This is uh, this is in eighteen eighty eight five sixty point four. I'll just uh, blow it on the screen so that uh, we are asking ourselves where is the law in all the things we have presented. Look here, she says in eighteen eighty eight five sixty point four. As we look, where is the law? Brethren, shall we not all of us leave our lords there? And when we leave this meeting, may it be with the truth burning in our souls like fire shut up in our bones. You will meet with those who will say, you are too much excited over this matter. You are too much in earnest. You should not be reaching for the righteousness of Christ and making, making so much of that. You see what people will say? But brother, you, you are preaching. Where is the law? Where are you placing the law? Why are you so honest about the righteousness of Jesus Christ? You are making too much of that. And she says, this brother will tell you, you should preach the law. But then she has this to say, as a people, we have preached the law until we are as dry as the hills of Gilboa that had neither dew nor rain. 
we must preach Christ in the law and there will be sap and nourishment in the preaching that will be as food to the famishing flock of God. We must not trust in our own merits at all, but in the merits of Jesus of Nazareth. Our eyes must be anointed with eye salve. We must draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to us if we come in his own appointed way. So we are not coming in our way, but in his way. All that you may go forth as the disciples did after the day of Pentecost, and then your testimony will have a living ring and souls will be converted to God. And so let me go back to the question then. Uh, the real question is, uh, where is the law? And uh, that is what I want to handle just in a few slides and uh, we close. The question was asked then, after all has been said, after you sing about the righteousness of Jesus Christ, where is the law then? And here are the few slides that he, she has to talk about the law. In 1888, 557, paragraph 2, after, uh, after saying that some will tell you that you are so honest with this matter, you are so honest with Christ's righteousness, preach the law. He said, let the law take care of itself. We have been at work on the law until we get as dry as the hills of Gilboa without due or rain. Let us trust in the merits of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. May God help us that our eyes may be anointed with eyesight that we may see. God helping us, we will draw nigh to him and he says he will draw nigh to us. Do we believe? Will we come in God's appointed way? May the Lord help us and enlighten us that we may go forth from this place as they went forth to proclaim the truth after the day of Pentecost. And there were souls converted, they could not resist the testimony. Again, 1888, 17.2. We hear so many things preached in regard to the conversion of the soul that are not the truth. We are hearing a lot of things concerning conversion of the soul. The, and these things are not the truth. Men are educated to think that if a man repents, he shall be pardoned. Supposing that repentance is the way, the door into heaven, that there is a certain assured value in repentance to buy for him forgiveness. Can man repent of himself? No more than he can pardon himself. Tears, sighs, resolution, all these are but the proper exercise of the faculties God has given to man. And the turning from sin in the amendment of a life which is God's. Not your life, but the life which is of God. Where is the merit in the man to earn his salvation or to place before God something which is valuable and excellent? Can an offering of money, house, lands, place yourself on the deserving list? Impossible. There is danger regarding justification by faith as placing merit on faith. When you take the righteousness of Christ as a free gift, you are justified freely through the redemption of Christ. What is faith? The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, I say the substance of things hoped for is imputed righteousness. The evidence of things not seen is the imparted righteousness. See how this works. It is a something. You hope for something. Christ has implanted a seed in you, which has undying element, which has a germinating principle. And that substance, now, as you live daily, it is an evidence of things not yet seen. You live as if you know that heaven exists. And yes, it exists, although it's not seen. You live for it. And so faith, the summation of faith is imputed righteousness propelling you or propelling the wheels of uh, imparted righteousness. I mean, without imputed righteousness, the wheels of imparted righteousness cannot be there. And if you have what we may term as imparted righteousness, that is good works and all this stuff, without believing Jesus Christ is your savior, then you are as good as any other person who lives in this world who doesn't believe. You are as good as an atheist because Atheists do a lot of good things, but they don't believe Christ is there. You, you can be as that, but uh, you, you can be just uh, like uh, the offerings of Cain, who never really appreciated what his atonement and did what he could do. It was a good work to bring the sacrifice he brought, 
but it had in, in it what we call an atonement. That is justification. That is imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. So it is an ascent of the understanding to God's word. Faith is an ascent of the understanding to God's word, which binds the heart in willing consecration and service to God. Who gave the understanding? Who moved on the heart? Who first drew the mind to view Christ on the cross of Calvary? Faith is rendering to God the intellectual powers, abandonment of the mind and will to God, and making Christ the only door to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Not another person. Not another third being, of course. Many commit the error of trying to define minutely the fine points of distinction between justification and sanctification. Into the definition of these two terms, they often bring their own ideas and speculations. Why try to be more minute than is inspiration on the vital question of righteousness by faith? So the issues on justification and sanctification are the vital questions of righteousness by faith. And sometimes we go into theological gymnastics, which uh, try to define these things so minutely until we lose the real article that uh, we are looking into, which is uh, the Christ righteousness. Why try to work out every minute point as if the salvation of the soul depended upon all having exactly your understanding of this matter? All cannot see in the same line of vision. You are in danger of making a world of an atom and an atom of a world. And remember, John's being a... Uh, 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 caution on his extreme use on sanctification. Oh, the Christian's last days may be fragrant as we bring this to a close because the beams of the sun of righteousness shine through the light, diffusing a perpetual fragrance. Oh, what a reason, oh, what reason have we for joy that our Redeemer poured out his precious blood on the cross as an atonement for sin and by his obedience to death brought in everlasting righteousness. You know that today he is at the Father's right hand, a prince of life, a savior. There is no other name wherein you can trust your eternal interest, but in Christ you may rely fully implicitly. Christ has been loved by you, although your faith has sometimes been feeble and your prospect confused, but Jesus is your savior. He does not save you because you are perfect, but because you need him and in your imperfection, have trusted in him. If you think that you can be righteous and come before God and be accepted, no, come as you are. And even though our sins are as red as scarlet, he will make us white as snow. We can come to him in our imperfection and trust him that he will save us even unto the uttermost. But what Adam required, but that which God required of Adam in paradise before the fall, he requires in this age of the world from those who will follow him. Perfect obedience to his law. But righteousness without a blemish can only be obtained through the imputed righteousness of Christ. If you want to claim that you have righteousness, claim the imputed righteousness of Christ. A Daniel is talking about this article. He says, if the article of justification be once lost, then is all true Christian doctrine lost. He then that strayed from the, this Christian righteousness must needs fall into the righteousness of the law. That is to say, when he hath lost Christ, he must fall into the confidence of his own works. For if we neglect the act of justification, we lose it altogether. Therefore, most necessary it is, chiefly, and above all things that we teach and repeat this article continually. Yea, though we learn it and understand it well, yet is there none that taketh hold of it perfectly or believeth it with his heart. Therefore, I fear lest this doctrine will be defaced and darkened again when we are dead. For the world must be replenished with horrible darkness and errors before the latter day come. Luther on Galatians and uh, being quoted by A.G. Daniels. In Christ, um, our righteousness, page uh, 90, paragraph 4. Reaction of the listeners in that uh, Minneapolis conference. We hear a lot of things about this conference. One, some accepted the message and supported Wagoner, E.G. White, Will White, Haskell, uh, Haskell, and Wilcox. Two, some rejected the message, Uriah Smith, J.H. Morrison, Conrad, Conrad et al., and number three, the majority were undecided. They did not know what to believe. Now, try to remember the delegates that were gathered there in the Minneapolis conference. 
in the next presentation we shall be looking was the message accepted but i want to go back to this slide some accepted the message some rejected the majority were undecided i want to close here if this was the situation in 1888 with all these delegates coming from various churches to the conference so that uh, they may receive a message that will culminate into the loud cry and the outpouring of the latter rain, and only a handful of them received it, and others opposed it, but the majority did not know anything what to go back and tell the congregation. How could the third angel's message of Revelation 14 be proclaimed? when the very people who were to go back to the churches enlightened were confused on what actually the conference was all about and they could not understand or explain a thing of what had been presented. But what was the cause of this confusion? Because of how those in leadership were behaving. And so we can stand here today and say the message was accepted, which is the option number one. If the message was accepted, then why are we here today? If the message was rejected, then we have to go back to the drawing board and see what was preached and how was it presented and how are we supposed to present it? And then present it and see the Lord attend to it. There is num number three, that many were confused. Many did not understand what to go to tell their congregation or to preach about. Now, if this is the issue, also we have to be so careful today. As we call delegates from various churches, and from various conferences and all over the world and try to understand 1888, what kind of impression are we living? Are we again repeating the 1888 that many come from these meetings not understanding a thing and not having what to tell their congregation? And so what we need today is uh, not so much doctrines that we are fighting for because we come together as people and we pour out a lot of doctrines to the people and the doctrines are not even attached to Christ. Just as um, really the law was not attached to Christ as Adventism headed to, towards 1888. These doctrines that we have, we must preach Christ in these doctrines. We have been as dry as the hills of Gilboa because there is no blood of Jesus Christ who is our atoning sacrifice mingled in these messages that are being given. It is either that person or this person or the other. When you ask the people, how are you progressing in your spiritual journey? They, they, they can only point you to another man. I, I'm so delighted with the sermon that so and so preached. And you can have a conversation for one hour with a person talking about uh, Christian things and never even mention Christ in these things. And so people, people have a lot of intellectual knowledge, but devoid of Christ, who should be the propeller of these messages, who should be the fulcrum and the center stage of everything. And so let us revisit again these doctrines that um, we have and see how have we prevent, how, 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 how have we presented them. And if really we have been presenting Christ in these messages, all these reforms that we have, all these doctrines we have, then I'm sure we wouldn't be here but we are stuck in 1888 where men looked at men and preached the law until they became as dry as the hills of Gilboa. To take an example of the message of one true God. We have preached it until it has turned to, into a sledgehammer hammer because Christ has been left out of this issue. We mentioned Christ to show forth how is the son of God, but the practical aspect of uh, receiving Jesus Christ, of knowing Jesus Christ as the Son of God has been devoid. And uh, in closing, I'd just like to uh, make a, how is the message of one true God practical unto us? I just want to read one verse as uh, uh, we conclude this. And uh, this is uh, Matthew 
look at uh, what is the really the message of one true God. I want us to see this in Second Peter chapter one, verse one and two. Those are what I'm just going to read. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and the Savior of Jesus Christ. So the, the whole issue is about faith, the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And if you turn to John 17, verse 3, and this is eternal life, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Now, that knowledge of God and Jesus Christ, what should it produce? Grace and peace. What is grace? The enabling power to overcome sin. For the grace of God has appeared to all men, teaching them to deny ungodliness and live soberly in the present world. So the knowledge of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, should produce grace and peace. It should be multiplied. This knowledge of God and Jesus Christ, this is life eternal that they may know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. This message, when we preach it, people should see grace and peace being multiplied in us. But what is being seen in us? You can only go to the social medias and see what the knowledge of God and Jesus Christ has brought unto us. Debate, confusion, and divisions. This is the only thing that it has brought. And so how essential has that been knowledge? It like, it's like it has not been essential at all. And so, if men could go back and look at the picture of Jesus Christ fully and accept him on who he is, accept the merits, not just to see him as the son of God, the real son, but um, to accept him as the one whose the life of God flows through unto us, according to Zion of Ages 21, and that life returns as a tide of beneficence. If that is the concept we can have, the experience we can have on the knowledge of God and his son, then this knowledge will have some practical aspect and it will go like a wildfire. But we may preach this message until the hand goes to it is pen, but uh, uh, the, the hand goes to it is placed. And Christ will never come. And so how I pray that we may revisit Minneapolis 1888 and see the implications. What did Christ want to do with us? With all this doctrine streamlined and in place, yet Christ not coming in 1888 and also not coming today. What is the missing mark in all this? And we shall continue seeing as we continue looking at this material actually what did God want to do with his people at that time. Otherwise, may the Lord bless us and um, may we continue in the spirit of Christ and may we seek him more than never before. Shall we close with um, a word of prayer? Savior, we thank you because uh, there is nothing that you can withhold from us. Father, you have given your son as a, a savior unto us, as a propitiation and uh, we don't want just to know about him as your son. We want to know him as a personal savior. We want his gospel to become a personality in our lives. And so, please, whatever place that we have missed to do things the, the way you should do them, give us the strength to be reconciled unto thee and uh, seek thee more than we seek any other thing. And so, let this minefield of truth work out. Uh, a difference in our lives to creating us a character that is acceptable before thee. And so thank you for your spirit and thank you for Jesus Christ in Jesus' name. Amen.